Greetings and good morning to all young people throughout Kerala, beyond Kerala, India and indeed all those who belong to the human family worldwide. In this particular video, I hope to explain the implied meaning of a very memorable and sometimes puzzling teaching of Jesus Christ in which he says, if the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. I repeat, if the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. It is in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 36. Now, young people, quite obviously, are very fond of and very protective of their freedom, their personal liberty. And... Uh, the degree to which the zeal would vary from culture to culture, but youth everywhere in the world are insistent on the freedom they are entitled to. They are not willing to barter it for anything else. So to them in particular, this teaching should make a special appeal as well as pose a very unique challenge and therefore this humble attempt to unpack what possibly could be the meaning of Jesus' teaching. What does it mean to say that we shall know true freedom only if the Son of God, Jesus, sets us free? What is this freedom? In order to understand this, we have to go back a little, not a little, a great deal in time. Go back to the beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, where the creation of man, uh, the, creation, the history of creation, and in particular the creation of humankind, is recorded. There is a very noticeable difference between the way Jesus creates all other aspects of creation and human beings. Everything else, God speaks into existence. God says, let there be, and there was. But in the case of human beings, if you go by the second chapter, the account given of the second chapter, God shapes Adam out of the mud of the earth, or the dust of the earth, and then breathes into him. In other words, there is a need to go beyond the material order of things in order to understand what is unique about human beings. And I believe that uh, this inalienable aspect of human life, namely freedom, belongs to that particular dimension. To be human is to be free, or to be unfree is to be less than human. And a life without freedom is a life not worth living uh, and therefore the theme that we are handling is of extreme significance. Now, in the first book of, uh, first chapter of the book of uh, Genesis, when the detailed account of uh, creation is provided, Chapter 1, verse 3 says, God says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, obviously, that light is energy, but it's not energy as we know it through sun and moon or electricity or other forms of energy that we are familiar with. This energy is what uh, the French philosopher Henry Bergson and following him or maybe contemporaneous with him, Bernard Shaw, called Ilan Vital or the vital life, uh, the impulse of life, the life impulse. Now, when it comes to dealing with realities of this order, you will know that language is very limited because language develops according to the common uh, and uh, familiar experiences of human beings. It's not that language is always completely insensitive to uh, supra sensuous experiences, but the extent to which any language in the world has developed vis-a-vis -vis the supernatural or supra-sensuous or metaphysical realities are concerned is quite limited. 
So we have to leave a margin for that. Now, what is created at the very beginning, at the outset of creation itself, is this life impulse, this life energy, this vital principle. Uh, I can't think of better words than this to denote it. The point is that that vital energy, the divine principle, is subsumed in every aspect of creation. For example, when God says, let there be birds, and birds come into existence, that divine life principle, the impulse of life is present in the birds. Or even when God says, let there be trees, let there be plants, etc., it is the same principle that works, but within a different format or different mode. So you see a progressive unfolding of the mind of God, the creative mind of God, if you examine the, the record of creation. Whether creation happened exactly in that manner, whether this record is of this report or scientific, etc., this is not our concern at the moment. I'm quite willing to accept that this is not a scientific account of creation. I have no problem in considering that. But the, my point is that this account offers uh, the sort of insights into the realities of life, the secrets of life, if you like, of the, or the principle of life that science or anything else uh, cannot offer. So this vital energy, this life principle or this divine impulse is present. Now when it comes to creating trees, plants, etc., it as assumes a particular mode. And the distinctive feature of that mode is that it is limited to the creation of forms without mobility. As far as the vegetable life is concerned, to the best of our knowledge, uh, they all have forms, but they don't have mobility to the extent. They have mobility. Their mobility is quite curtailed. They don't have mobility to the extent that mobility is present in the animal kingdom. So when the same divine impulse or the vital principle of life operates in the creation of human, uh, in the creation of animals, then it goes a step beyond the creation of form and limited movement to a far greater degree of freedom in relation to movement. And that's what we find in animals. Animals are uh, a great deal freer than plants and trees in terms of physical mobility. In fact, some of the animals far outstrip human beings. No man can run. Uh, as fast as a cheetah does, for example. <clears throat> but even this is limited. So the same vital principle, when it is infused into the creation of humankind, it acquires something more than mere form and mobility. It also acquires the capacity for thought and consciousness. Thought and consciousness. That's an amazing thing. But the problem is this, that even the thought and consciousness that distinguish human beings in its natural state or what, what has come to be the natural state, which the Bible says an unnatural state in the light of the doctrine of the fall of human beings, which curtail human freedom, is seriously limited. That is because nature is a domain of comparative unfreedom. There is freedom of movement, but to what extent nature as nature has freedom of thought, we do not know. But we do know that animals can think, but their range of thinking is limited. And that thinking is limited largely to what is necessary and good for oneself as a discrete individual. Uh, it is widely agreed that an animal cannot think of its species in a, an intellectual or conscious 
or raci, raci, ra, uh, 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 rational fashion. Um, a, a tiger will recognize a fellow tiger instinctively, but a tiger will not sit and meditate on what it means to be a tiger and what it be, means to belong to the species of tiger. Uh, what is the tiger nature, as it were? All these things are exclusive to human beings. So, in biblical thought, there is a contrast between life in nature and life in spirit. Now we come to a very significant stage in our unpacking the meaning of what Jesus is saying. Two possibilities. One is life in nature. Nature is also God's creation. But God created nature within a very limited mode in which the farther, farther reaches are to be acquired by human beings in a special way. As far as the other freedoms are concerned, they're natural. They come to us without any special effort. But there are dimensions of freedom that we have to attain in a special way. Uh, so two types of freedoms. One is freedom given. Second, freedom to be attained. And in the thinking of Jesus Christ, there's a correlation between the second dimension of freedom, namely the freedom to be gained or freedom to be attained to human growth and development, but human growth and development as human beings, not as animals. So what happens is, so long as human beings remain confined to the mode of nature, we remain subject to these familiar or natural limitations in our thought, in our understanding, in our awareness. And this is what is often referred to as living at the animal level. Now, if you read On Life, a small book, not, not worth it's about 350 pages by Tolstoy, he constantly refers to animal life or animal life, spirituality as the transcendence of our animal life towards a life in spirit, life in spirit. Even a secular author like Arnold Toynbee, the famous uh, British historian, uh, whose classic work, A Study of History, is unrivaled uh, in the study of history, uh, in his uh, lesser-known book titled The Historian's Approach to Religion, which is a book I recommend strongly to all of you to read, he says that, you know, human uh, existence in the world has two dimensions. One is the ter terrestrial dimension, and that is acted upon by the spirit of the age. But he says there is another possible dimension where human condition is impacted from something beyond that level, beyond the terrestrial condition and the spirit of the age. That is, if you like the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. So even in the secular perception, then this awareness does exist. Uh, now, a philosopher of history like Hegel <clears throat> clearly develops this thought. And in fact, Hegel sees history as a progressive self-realization and revelation of God. It's a controversial thesis, but uh, I think it's a very uh, challenging uh, thesis that uh, merits our attention. So, if we remain confined to the, the laws of nature, the limitations, every law is a limitation. Uh, li remain limited to the scope of nature, then we have natural life, as natural as it can be, and natural life also accommodates unnatural modes of existence and natural activities, tastes, preferences, etc. The na any state also implies its opposite. That's why to God there is also an adversary called Satan. If there is night, there is also daytime. If there are good times, there are also bad times. Laughter also impl implies tears. Uh, the, uh, the crest will have a trough. Mountain top will have a valley, so on and so forth. So, 
if we live only according to the principle of nature, we live a very finite life. And in that finite life, our freedom is limited. Our freedom is limited to what is relevant to very ordinary life, within which survival and self-preservation are top priorities. Uh, so if you tell a person who lives in that state that he has to set his mind on things high, he would laugh at you. Because he would say, that's of no relevance. It's, of, it's, it's no use to, use to me. In fact, what we consider to be useful and necessary depends on the level at which we pitch our life. If we live like animals, then our needs are very limited. Needs of the higher kind are very limited. But the higher we go, our higher needs increase. That's why the psalmist says, as a heart pants after the brook, so does my heart long for you, O God. We don't experience that deep thirst and longing for God because we have not really reached that level of growth. So when we break out of this determinism or necessity of nature, in nature everything is fixed and limited. There's no freedom in nature except the freedom that I've referred to, namely the limited freedom which is germane to the existing order. Nature by itself will not envisage a different order of existence. Nature will not reform itself. Nature will not dream of a revolution and a completely different social political order. That capability is given only to human beings. So when we are in Christ Jesus or when Christ sets us free, is actually liberating us from our subjection to the laws of nature or to the um, the domination of the principle of necessity which rules nature and determines all its possibilities and experiences. And that is when we move from the world of nature to the world of miracles. Now, miracles are not to be understood in the way they are understood in, the, in popular religiosity. They are not there for the sake of sensationalism. They are not there for some people to have uh, you know, abrupt dramatic benefits and uh, to be treated as people of special entitlement by God. That's not the idea. The idea or the spiritual meaning of miracles is, look, there are possibilities far beyond your comprehension uh, and you will realize that these possibilities are real only when you move out of this determinism of nature, that the very nature which limits you to certain well-familiar, well-set, predetermined possibilities and that wall is broken and you are set free and you enter a different world, a different order of possibilities. In that order, in that new order, the order of spirit. So in our spiritual life what we do is we move from the sphere of nature to the realm of the spirit without abandoning without uprooting ourselves from the world of nature because till we die, we are rooted in the world of nature. But we are able to transcend the determinism or the limitations or the various facets of the finitude, the limitations to which we are subject when we move from the domination of nature, the necessity of nature to the freedom of spirit. Do not use the definite article, the spirit, because spirit does not have to be uh, specified. Spirit is not specific, spirit is universal. What is use, universal cannot be specific. So always say freedom of spirit. Now what Jesus does, what Jesus offers is freedom of this kind, freedom of spirit which transcends the limitations of life in nature. For example, if you ask a person whose uh, self-awareness, whose worldview, whose way of understanding reality is limited to the necessity of nature or the uh, logic of nature, whether personal transformation is possible, he is sure to laugh at it and dismiss it out of court. Such a possibility does not exist within the order of nature. That possibility exists only in the realm of spirit. 
because the realm of spirit is a possibility of in uh, is a realm of infinite possibilities so it's interesting to see that there are three levels one is the level of nature which is the level of the finite then there is a level of God, uh, the realm of god which is purely infinite the opposite of finite infinite but in between there is a spiritual life which is planted it has its legs it has its feet planted in the finite but its possibilities are now re re ranging and roaming in the infinite so religious life is a kind of paradoxical life in which there is a, one becomes a bridge between nature and god so the word supernatural implies nature as well as what is beyond nature so we can live not metaphysical life or a pure life of spirit as long as we are on planet earth we can only lead supernatural we can only lead a life of supernatural possibilities because the supernatural is a bridge between the natural and the supra sensuous or shall we say the divine now that possibility is exciting is breathtakingly exciting in terms of its unlimited possibilities including freedom freedom of a kind that from within the realm of nature we cannot properly imagine now what exactly that state is and what are its infinite possibilities etc cannot be documented for the reason that anything that relates to spirit with a capital s is and must forever remain unpredictable therefore you cannot write a manual on what will happen if you enter life of spirit all that we can say for sure is that you will be uh, set free from the limitations of the finitude which is necessarily inherent in our life in nature and how that tremendous incomparable freedom works you know in in its specific details in your life cannot be predicted in advance because as jesus says spirit works like the wind it blows where it pleases no one knows where it comes from where it goes utter unpredictability is the indefeasible feature indefeasible feature that is uh, it cannot be uh, taken away from uh, in alienable in um, irreducible uh, nature of spirit so this is the new quality of life that jesus promises and this order of uh, liberty where the world cannot understand no culture knows it no culture can grant it and no human being who is still rooted only in nature can believe in it make use of it or even cope with it as dostoevsky tells us even the extent of freedom that life in nature affords terrifies us because he says we are tormented by our freedom because freedom always confronts us with responsibility and most people do not want to accept responsibility even for themselves leave it on accepting responsibility for others so there is a tremendous truth in what jesus is saying if the sun makes you free or the sun sets you free you will be free indeed that's a true order of freedom the freedom that culture grants you the freedom the rebellious freedom that the spirit of the age sanctifies or sanctions for you is not true freedom it is a semblance of freedom and very often the exercise of freedom leads you to uh, wasting your substance as in the case of the parable of the young man who went away from his father exercising his freedom facilitated by the wealth of his father against whom uh, he rebels and the consequences is that he goes and wastes his substance so uh, there is a world of danger high lurking behind uh, this um, uh, worldly cultural natural idea of freedom whereas the order of freedom that jesus promises is um, not only different in degree but also different in kind 
and the exact component or the constituents or the pith or substance of this freedom is something that each individual has to experience and explore for himself, provided he allows himself to be liberated from his total subjection to the laws of and life and laws of nature and uh, is transformed into life in spirit when he becomes a new creation. That new creation is then uh, surrounded by a world of infinite possibilities and that's the blessed, blessedness to which Jesus calls us. I hope these reflections make some sense but I can assure you that uh, what is offered to you is merely as nuggets for thought uh, and not as a finished or, or satisfying answer. Uh, I request that you take up some of these insights and continue to uh, think on them, pursue these uh, possibilities of men, uh, meditation and exploration, and it will lead you to very significant and exciting conclusions. I thank you for your patient listening.